gentlemen. And uh, my thanks to the Institute for the invitation to come along and speak here today and obviously for the, the overall event itself. Uh, for those of you not familiar with uh, FDII, as the chairman said, we're a business sector within IBEC, uh, representing 150 food and drink companies. Three main areas of representation, uh, meat processing through Meat Industry Ireland and the Irish Association of Pig Meat Processors, uh, dairy processing through the Irish Dairy Industries Association and consumer foods through the Consumer Foods Council. Um, Food Harvest 2020, uh, very ambitious growth targets, but probably very achievable growth targets as well. What I'd like to do over the next uh, couple of minutes is perhaps uh, comment on some of the challenges and, and barriers that are faced and look at those in the context of a lot of what has been said over the course of uh, today. As was mentioned on a number of times already today, exports are, are doing well. We saw 11% growth last year, and we saw 14% growth over the first number of months of, of this year over and beyond last year's growth. So positive, positive performance. But at the same time, it's also worth noting that imports uh, have also resumed an upward trend. And if we take into account that um, in the grocery sector, food inflation is effectively zero, that would suggest that this is uh, volume growth that's taking place. So Irish food is being taken off Irish shelves and replaced with, with imported food. And I think that gives cause for consideration, particularly in relation to the competitiveness of Irish food, not just in the domestic marketplace, but also from an export perspective as well. I think the two are very, very much uh, inter interlinked. And I'll come back and maybe talk about it in, in a few seconds' time. One thing I noted today was um, a huge focus, obviously, on, on agri-food, on Food Harvest 2020, uh, and on the overseas exports. Um, perhaps there's time maybe to reflect and think a little bit about what this means for wider Irish society and for the wider Irish economy. And perhaps there's, 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 there's a need for greater communication to the, to the wider community out there, because it's very, very clear uh, in terms of how agri-food operates in terms of what it sources on the island, not just goods, but services as well, that it has a much, much greater impact than any other sector in the, the Irish economy. And if we look at this in terms of, of export growth, effectively what we're talking about is for every additional euro of sales from agri-food, we will see an impact on the rest of the economy in terms of goods and so on services sourced here in Ireland at least twice of, of any other sector. Some rough figures there, 75% of the materials that agri-food purchases are purchased here in Ireland. That compares at 5% for the pharma sector, which roughly has similar purchases to, to the sector. So when we grow, everyone else grows. And I think that's a message that everybody here in the room needs to impart to, to the wider Irish society. To come back to the cost competitiveness thing for, for a second, um, every time we export any bit of uh, agri-food product, there's costs embedded in it. There's Irish costs embedded in it. We need a renewed focus on things like energy. We've had a re relatively benign environment uh, over the last year or two in terms of energy and electricity in particular. But over the next 24 months or, or thereabouts, that's going to start to impact severely on the food sector again. At the same time, we face an increase in carbon costs. We face an increase in waste levies as well. All these things coming down the line and totally at variance with some of the growth targets that are there in, in 2020 obviously conscious of the time, so I'm not going to go through all, all these in detail, but to focus on one or two. Um, we've major policy risk issues here from a, from a European perspective as well. A lot of discussion this morning about the uh, EU budgets feeding into CAP, feeding into trade agreements as well. 2.5 billion for this globalization fund, which on a rough calculation works out at about 350 million a year. Compare and contrast that with the, the threat from uh, tens of thousands of high value stake cuts being uh, placed on the EU market. We also heard discussion this morning in relation to innovation and some of the regulatory risk which is around things like say the health claims legislation. So the manner in which the likes of EFSA actually interpret the legislation will have a huge impact and already have had a huge impact on companies' innovation plans. Some talk as well about commodities. Uh, what's noticeable from this graph, and this is taken from the latest uh, FAO um, Outlook document, is the increased amplitude 
and frequency for most of the, the major commodity groups. Even if we take the, the dotted line out, which is, is sugar, which has been going all over the place, uh, and take a look at a lot of the others, it's, it's increasing the, the whole time. From a food industry perspective, this causes huge problems, which I'll talk about a little bit more on, on the next slide. But I think in the context of the debate on CAP, from a food industry perspective, the important issue for us is to try and bring back some degree of sustainability and stability to the raw materials supply base uh, for us. Not necessarily a return to the, to the managed markets environment of, of before, but it is something which needs to be looked at because as you can see there, it's going on an upward trend the whole time. Specifically from a food industry perspective, if we move the uh, commodity uh, graph forward by six months, we start to, to see a degree of correlation um, with uh, the Consumer Price Index uh, for food. That's the OECD uh, uh, CPI, not the, the Irish one, by, by the way. But what is noticeable is there's a significant degree of, of stickiness uh, in price transmission through the food chain. And that impacts on, on everybody right along the, the food chain. The ultimate impact from a food industry perspective is it causes a major cash crunch. And I think if we look at the news out of the UK last week in the trading statement from, from Premier Foods, that's a classic example of the, the sort of things which, which can occur. Um, and there's a number of different causes uh, for, the, for the, the, the stickiness and for the volatility in the, in, in the first place. But of course, one of those is the, the whole issue of, of buyer power. And we are facing, not just in Ireland, but right across Europe, increasingly high concentrations of, 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 of retail concentration. And that has an impact right back along the, the supply chain, because ultimately what it does is it causes an imbalance of power between suppliers and, and, and their customers. And there'll be people out there will, which will tell you this is about the, you know, the, the, the emperor's new clothes and so on, but that's not the reality. The reality is for the vast, vast majority of food companies right across Europe, this is the reality. And what exactly is the reality? The reality is the non-respective contractual terms by customers, delisting threats, and unilateral deductions of invoices. They're the most common occurrences. So how do they actually manifest themselves in a business sense, they manifest themselves in terms of an impact on the cash flow of businesses. So ultimately what this does is it has a huge impact on the business planning and the investment decisions that these companies make. And it has an impact and a ripple effect right down along the supply chain. On a semi-related point, um, private label. Now, private label in itself, there's no particular problem with it. There's many companies have substantial and very positive businesses out of this and a very, very good working relationships with retailers. And in many instances, it's the first step to get onto retail shelves. But if you take a look at the percentages which are there, these are growing percentages. No doubt they've been accelerated somewhat by the recession of the last two years, and we'll probably see a little bit of an easing back. But it's growing and it's consistently growing over the last decade, decade and a half. So let's take a worst case scenario. Let's say this hits 60%, 70%, 80% or, or thereabouts, maybe 100%. What's that going to do in terms of the brand strategies for companies? What's that going to do in terms of the innovation strategies uh, for companies? There may well be a natural barrier for this. Um, maybe companies will increase their, their investment in brands and, and, and fight back or bring out innovative products. But it is in part related to the whole buyer power uh, debate. But this is a debate which is, is beginning and is beginning to grow and is something worth considering a little bit more. So what next? Well, this is currently where we are. It's a little bit different from the, the pitch out the, the back here. Now, we're not exactly saying that we're going to have a, a highly level manicured pitch like the, the one out the back there, but what I think is needed in the relationship between food companies and their customers is a, a degree, a framework to provide a degree of fair trading. So is this something, and as you know, there's been a debate about this for a number of years uh, in Ireland, but it is probably worth noting that many countries have addressed this issue already. There's legislation and there's effective codes in the UK, France, Hungary, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Russia. Investigations are underway or have been completed with a recommendation to introduce a code in Norway, the Netherlands, in Portugal, in Romania, in Spain, in Sweden, in Germany, and in Greece. In fact, today, in Strasbourg, in the European Parliament, they're actually debating and voting on this issue. 
And those statistics which I've just shown you there, which are a European-wide survey carried out by the European Food Association's CIA, now Food Business Europe, and AIM, the European Brands Association, are part of a report, a retail monitoring report, which endorses that survey and has a major discussion and makes recommendations in the whole area of unfair trading practices, which has been voted on today by the European Parliament in Strasbourg. And that's part of what we're referring to as the uprising over the last two or three years. And this is part of a broader debate in terms of the, the food supply chain and the degree of dysfunctionality that exists in it at the moment. And it's about the returns that people are making at various stages along the, the supply chain. But this has been addressed not just by the Parliament, but by the Commission, who've established a business-to-business -business commercial relations platform and are doing a serious amount of detailed work in the, this whole area. What's interesting as well is they're not just looking at it in the context of legislating for, for the area, they're also looking at it in terms of good business practices. How do, they actually, how do they actually bring out about a degree of efficiency through fair trading in the relationship between the food sector and their, their customers? Coming back to home, We've had commitments in, I think it's two or three programmes for government now at this stage. We've had public consultations, we've had a facilitation process, but we still have no code. We're over 100 days into the new government. We're still waiting at this stage. Oops. Not exactly perhaps the finale that I, I wanted, but really just to, to sum up and to, to, to finish off, um, I just wanted to touch on one or two of the specific areas. Time is short, obviously. But I think in, in summary, in terms of Food Harvest 2020 in, in, in particular, uh, it's noticeable the energy that surrounds it right across the, the sector. Um, there's now a long-term plan in place for the sector to optimise its resources. I think it's very much centre stage in terms of the economy's expectations. There are challenges and there are barriers. Uh, my belief now is that these must be our focus to achieve the growth targets which are eminently achievable. Thank you. Thank you.